In this lecture video, we're going to focus more on the idea of the completion of care. We're going to look at particular cases of how one would care for others and the subjective taking up of care uh, by the other person who's being cared for. And, and you know, what counts as uh, actually being cared for and flourishing by the other? How would you know that the other is flourishing? So, care, right, when we care for someone, it's only capital letters care when it's completed through its reception, through the other person recognizing, right, your care, that they are taking up your care as care. Kate writes that the normative content, content of care is, uh, that is to say, what distinguishes care, capital letters care, from care, is that it is taken up by the other as all capital letters, caring, right? So when we talk about care in all capital letters, it involves all these components that an ethics of care advocates, as opposed to simply the uh, typical term when we just talk about, you know, caring for something like, oh yeah, I care, I care about that movie or something like that, you know, where it doesn't involve actually caring for someone. So we need to remember, right, that when you receive care, this does not mean that there is an uh, imbalance necessarily in power where, where another person is being submissive to someone else, right? That when care is given to another person, it's not the case that the other person is passive. Kate says, care is not something we do to something or someone, right? So it's not that like, you know, we are active when we care for the other who is passive. She says, it is something we do for another's benefit. There has to be an uptake on the other's part if our action is to count as a benefit for the other. If the other is not benefited, has not taken up our actions as a good, we have failed to confer a benefit. And I like this example uh, that, that she speaks about here on page 186. She says, It was only when I found myself having to care for my 92-year-old mother that I came to appreciate the idea that care needs to be completed in the other. Unlike my daughter, my mother would sometimes acknowledge my care with words of praise and thanks, but more often she would fiercely resist my attempts to help her. Sesha's response, her, her um, disabled daughter, to our caring presented a stark contrast to my mother's bitterness at her powerlessness and lost capacities. Faced with the intransigence of someone in need of care but who refuses it, I came to recognize that Sesha did in fact receive our care, her disabled daughter who um, you know, can't verbally communicate. I realized that she could in fact turn away, could, even with her limited means, resist, and get angry at her impotence as do some folks with whom she rooms. It suddenly became apparent that Sesha is much less passive than I had acknowledged. There are times when she makes it difficult for us to give her medication, when she turns away at something unpleasant we have to do, and there are other times when she clearly helps us to help her. I have come to see that Sesha's thriving is itself a responsiveness to our care, that the hugs, smiles, and her own distinctive kisses are still other forms of receiving our care. All this she does with a beautiful graciousness. It is precisely because Sasha receives her care with such grace that I was able to miss the fact that she does indeed complete our care. So, when we successfully care for another individual, when we enable their flourishing, right? they have to acknowledge this. They have to take up our care as care. And we cannot simply do what we think is best for them for their own flourishing. It has to be recognized by themselves. Kate outlines three propositions. One, and these aren't, uh, you know, definitive in themselves. There's more to be added. We will add on to more of these. We will uh, elaborate on these more to understand them better. But they're more of a beginning point, which then we have to apply and learn more about these propositions of, of what caring must involve. So the first is that care requires action or it is not yet caring. This is because nothing can have the effect of care if it is not put into action. Two, care is an achievement and to care is a success verb. And three, care requires that the object of the care respond 
in some way that results in the achievement of the act. That is, caring or requires that the cared for take up the actions as care. So let's look at the first one more closely. So the first proposition, okay, caring is a disposition to act. A caring person is a just person with a disposition to act in a caring manner, right? So they've cultivated a certain virtue such that they care about caring for the sake of caring, and they learn when to do it, right? Such that it becomes almost normal in how they act. They don't really have to think about it so much. It becomes an attitude. Kite says of this, we can say that in all its senses, action has a bearing on anything we want to call care. To care for or about or to be a caring person is to engage in caring activities or to be prepared to engage in actions that such care demands. To have cares is to have concerns about matters we believe are important to act upon, if such action is doable and advisable. To care for a person in the sense of having affection for that person is to be motivated to act to benefit the person when we are able to do so. And to be a caring person is to act in a caring manner when the occasion demands it. Right? So I shouldn't have to wait on someone else to ask for help. If I have developed the virtue uh, of care, I would just know when to act and in what way to act to ensure that I can uh, meet the needs of the person. The second proposition, care as an achievement term, right? So it's not enough that we, we try to care for someone else or that we simply care about caring. We actually have to achieve care. Right? So this is the consequentialist aspect of care ethics. So having a virtuous disposition to care or, like I said, acting on duty isn't enough to be care. Kate says, a caring attitude is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So we must have that, but just because we have that attitude doesn't mean we're morally good individuals. So if the action fails to provide the benefit or offers a benefit but causes more harm than good, then the action is not praiseworthy as a caring action, no matter if it reveals a praiseworthy character and a praiseworthy intention. Right, so where Kant said that the only thing good in itself is a good will, where as long as you have that good will, you're, you can be a good person, that it doesn't matter about the consequences of your actions, as long as you carry out your actions according to the categorical imperative, right? That's not the case here. You need that, in a sense, good will, but you actually have to uh, 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 give care to someone else such that then you fulfill uh, the action and it is taken up by the other person as care. So what matters then, right, what counts for an ethics of care is whether they receive the care they require and that the care is received as care. The third proposition, caring must be taken up as care. So one, uh, again, difference with care, act, with care ethics where um, it distinguishes itself from like rule-based ethics like in deontology and utilitarianism is that purely objective measures for caring are insufficient. So we can't just think what the uh, ultimate account of caring is. We can't come up with some conception that like every rational individual would recognize this as, as flourishing, right? And so therefore we can perform whatever action we want for someone else to enable that flourishing on an objective count, right? There is a subjective component here that we have to uh, uh, take account of and incorporate into our uh, dispositions to act morally. So Kate says here, in the case of the plant, right? If I want to care for a a, a house plant, that participation that participation is akin to a heliotropic response. That is, it is without intention, will, or agency of any sort but it is a responsiveness that is inherent in that sort of being, right? So with the plant, as long as I water the plant, the only way I know whether I care for it or not is of course, whether it survives or not. There's no you know, degree, there's no difference in you know, caring that might be required as there is with human beings and the different desires they have that would constitute their own unique account of flourishing. 
Right, so continuing, Kate says, as there is no subjectivity on the part of the plant, whether or not care has been given can be determined entirely from a third person standpoint, right? So it's just objective whether or not you care for the plant or not, right? Either the plant survives or it dies. Human beings and other sentient creatures are not like that at all. So according to an object objective account, right? Uh, we can't really care too much as long as that end goal is met. But with creatures that have subjectivity, a carer can care too much, right? So my cat who's sick with uh, a form of, of uh, cancer, I might care too much about her well-being and I might attend to her so much that I stress her out and I actually don't enable her flourishing. In that case, I'm trying to come up with almost a third person perspective, or even I just care too much from, you know, um, my, 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 my concern for her that I'm not deliberating well about what my action should be in truly caring for my cat if I'm stressing her out and I'm not enabling her to, to, to fight off the cancer and flourish, right? So we have to always take into account what the other individual wants. And we can, in the case of my cat, right? It, it, she kind of whines, right? Almost like, you know, why are you doing this to me? Why are you moving me around, right? Where I might think, oh, maybe she wants to lay in this other spot as opposed to where she was laying because it's more comfortable. She might let me know, no, you know, that that's not what I want, you know, even though I might have good intentions, right? In that case, I can care too much. So, to flourish then as a conscious sentient being includes having the sense that we are flourishing, right? We have to recognize that we are being cared for and we have to recognize that we are fulfilling the desires and the ends that we, our own unique selves, have. So Kate says, those who willingly suffer for others live lives that are intensely attuned to the cares of others. They regard the flourishing of these others as essential to their own flourishing and to the degree that they engage these projects, theirs are flourishing lives, right? So according to an, ob an objective account of um, flourishing, we might see this kind of like sacrificing of oneself for another as um, limiting the own, th their own flourishing. But what Kate wants to point out here is that, continuing here with the quote, they are living the lives they want to live. They are doing what they care about. They are attending to their most urgent cares to what makes their lives meaningful, right? So it might be the case that one individual could retire at an early age, but they might end up working longer such that they can provide, you know, more resources for their children. And in this way, they might be, in a sense, sacrificing themselves to care for the other person. But if that's, you know, how they see themselves as flourishing, if that's how they see, make their um, lives meaningful in their own eyes, then even by doing that, they are flourishing, right? Which is why we can't have, for care ethics, a purely objective account of flourishing. Now, the subjective account, though, is necessary, uh, but it's not sufficient, right? So that individual who is cared for has to have their own idea of what it would mean for them to flourish. But it can't just simply be that, right? It can't just simply be that um, I uh, just taking care of my goldfish every day is like all I want to do and that enables my life, uh, you know, to have meaning. There's a way in which we have to acknowledge the relationships we have with others. And to some extent, that flourishing has to be taken up by one who would care for you. It has to be recognized as, at least for that person, something meaningful. But it could be the case that uh, if I really love caring for goldfish, that might just be too, seen as too ridiculous for others to respect as a, a, a form of flourishing that another person would want to enable. So there is, again, right, this interrelationship where you need this subjective account of flourishing, where one has this own sense of what makes their life meaningful, but that in, in one way or another has to be a um, uh, 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 taken up empathetically by someone else where they can recognize that as something that, you know, can be uh, um, flourishing, right? So there's a, a lot of moving parts here. You have to kind of juggle and take into account 
when you make your uh, um, uh, moral deliberations, right, as, as to what you should do to take care of someone else, and whether or not someone even needs to be cared for. Now, this subjective component of flourishing that care ethics uh, seeks to enable, um, it can be really difficult to, to, to parse out exactly how you should go about doing this. And we can look at this with the case of unconscious individuals. Now, again, we had talked about earlier how care ethics is both descriptive and normative, right? Care ethics takes place in practices which uh, um, to some extent can be natural, but we can denaturalize them, right? It doesn't have to only be women that perform, uh, you know, like mothering roles. Um, that there, you know, care, it has to be a moral concept. It has to be something where it's not just something that naturally occurs, but it's something we ought to do, each one of us, um, based on what the people we know need with their own unique conditions. So care can't simply be a natural disposition, Right? We can't just simply be paternalistic where we think we know what's best for, for others and we just simply uh, determine the lives of others. We have to take into account their own sense of autonomy, their own sense of free will, which is where the moral aspect right, uh, comes in, which is why care has to be a moral concept. So, Kate writes, The carer who acts in accordance with the moral concept care takes care as her regulative ideal. She disciplines herself to have what I have called a transparent self, a self that is respectful of the perspective of the other and the other's own conception of her needs and wants. So to, to truly care for someone else, we have to be able to take up the perspective of the other and recognize what they truly want and need, which is why we can't simply be paternalistic. We can't just simply to our friend, uh, if our friend really wants to do something, we actually think it's best if they don't do it, and so we stop them from doing it, right? We wouldn't be caring for them because we would be denying the other person the ability for them to flourish. But this can get very difficult to parse out. Well, how do I determine if I should care for someone, to what degree I should care for them, or, or what would count as caring for that individual? So we can start at more difficult cases and perhaps uh, work our way to uh, easier cases, depending on how you look at it. Although here we might be starting from a seemingly difficult case, but that actually might be uh, easier to parse out uh, how we should uh, perform care. So let's take the case of the permanently unconscious subject. Okay, Kate writes here a permanently, so this example here, a permanently comatose patient who would otherwise be considered a subject appears unable to take up the care of her caregiver either at the time the care is given or at a later time. Here, she says, I would submit that this, this patient can complete the care, but while in a comatose state, the patient's response is closer to the heliotropic-like response of the plant. A nurse tending to a comatose patient has, it, has to content herself with a body that stays clean and, for example, free of bed sores. It is the body, not the subject, that takes up the care. So what we want to be concerned with here in the case of the, the permanently unconscious subject is not the, the mind and desires of the subject, but the actual body of, of uh, the individual, which is why... Um, to some extent, right, we would have to become, as she said, intimately familiar with the uh, body of that subject. And this would be why it would be closer to the case of the plant, because the person can't actually respond to what they would desire or not. All we can base it on is, you know, are the vital signs okay? Um, you know, does the skin look like it's in a, a decent condition such that they can, you know, uh, um, not be in pain or, or can just continue to, to live in that state they're in, uh, in the best way possible. Now, what about the temporarily unconscious patient? So uh, she says, next, consider a less extreme case. 
An individual who is temporarily unconscious, say a person undergoing a surgical procedure. A surgeon who cuts into flesh, something that on the surface looks very uncaring, has to have the confidence that she has the skill to turn this action into an act of care, right? Because just in the act itself, you're cutting into the skin. We wouldn't think that just that act itself is a case of caring. It has to be for a certain reason, right? That can be taken up by the other as care. The action will be completed as such when the patient recovers and the condition that required the surgery is improved. But the patient, once awake and aware, is no longer merely a reactive body, right? Therefore, successful surgery may not count as care if this cure is enacted on a patient who never wanted the procedure, right? Because now, once they're no longer unconscious, we have to take into account their wants and desires. And if they would not have wanted that care, even though we successfully maybe re removed the tumor, if they didn't want that tumor removed for whatever reason, you know, is their own, then we would not have cared for them, even though we might have wanted that done for us. All right. Case three, the conscious being with underdeveloped judgment of his or her own good, right? So there are cases where we cannot penetrate the other's mind or we have good reason to believe that the other doesn't know their own mind or that their judgment is impaired, although subjectivity is still very much alive. Then it seems that paternalism is called, is both called for and is benign. But is it? Is paternalism really called for in this case where the person might not know what is their own good? Kate writes, the proper response to this objection is that when one's mind is underdeveloped or temporarily impaired, like let's say uh, they could be drunk, for example, the actions of the carer may only later be acknowledged as caring by the cared for, that is, when the cared for matures or regains function, right? So she talks about how it might be the case that oftentimes parents justify their actions by saying, look, yeah, sure, uh, my child really wanted to like eat cookies for breakfast and they didn't like it when I made them eat like a uh, um, banana and eggs okay but when they get older they will recognize that you know i was really caring for them and they'll come to appreciate uh, the care that i was giving them that would be correct but the child actually has to acknowledge it later in their life the person who's drunk if you do something to them that when later they're sober they look back on and think hey like i didn't actually like what you did to me there even though the person might have thought they were you know doing something good for them right, they had the best of intentions, then if that's the case, you wouldn't have actually successfully cared for them. You would have been acting like you know what their own good is, not taking into account what their own desires are, right, what they would take as flourishing, what they would want. Your caring would not be taken up as care by that other individual that you tried to care for. So case four, the child or adult with a disability affecting judgment. So this is similar to uh, Ava Kate's own daughter, Sesha. She gives this a really interesting example. She says, my own experiences of caring for my daughter seem to condemn my theory. When I give my daughter her anti-seizure medication, which is bitter and difficult to swallow, I do believe that I'm caring for her, even if she tries to spit it out and even if she hardly feels cared for at such times. In fact, not to give her this medicine would be negligent and morally culpable. If the medication works and she doesn't have seizures, I am caring for her by any objective measure. In that case, either the subjective uptake is unnecessary or counterintuitively, I am not being caring. Here's her response to that, that uh, argument that she, you know, um, uh, wouldn't be caring or that the you know subjective uptake isn't necessary by her daughter who who uh, dislikes visibly dislikes the seizure medication she says my response is that in such instances when one is dealing with someone whose judgment or communicative capability is impaired in ways that preclude their endorsement of a vitally important issue of care the carer must effectively construct a counterfactual so here's the case if the cared for could understand, then she would endorse my actions as care. Now, again, with the case of the person who's uh, either uh, 
briefly unconscious or uh, briefly cognitively impaired, like if they're drunk or whatever, um, we can actually find out whether or not they would take up that caring as uh, that care as caring. But here's the case where we will, you know, Sesha will never be able to actually acknowledge in the way that we we would think someone who is drunk and then is sober can acknowledge uh, the care given by someone else or, or or reject that care. So. What Kate says is we can come up with a counterfactual where we, we can say, well, look, you know, based on what I know of, of my daughter, Sesha, um, even though she might, you know, turn away when I try to give her the, the, the uh, seizure medication, that if she could understand why I give her the seizure medication, she would accept the care that's being given to her with, you know, her taking the, the seizure medication. So she says, so I say, were Sesha to understand the purpose of the medication, she would take it willingly. This is sometimes referred to as hypothetical consent in the bioethics literature. But, of course, one has to be careful with counterfactuals. In principle, they can be used to justify all sorts of coercion, right? Because we can oftentimes think of someone where they might say, well, you know, I mean, if, if they really understood, right, then they would appreciate what I'm doing for them. And there are kind of really messed up movies about this. Um, there's a movie I watched recently, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but where uh, this mother, you know, really takes care of her daughter in, in this daughter's condition where she can't, she can't use her legs, can't walk, has to take all this different kind of medication. But it turns out uh, the mother was actually making her daughter be in the situation where she needed all that care, right? And then the mother was like, no, 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 you know, don't you understand? I'm really caring for you. You know, I, uh, you know, if you were in my position, you would understand why I want, you know, to do all this for you because it's for your own good. Well, that would be a case where, you know, in the movie, the person's not uh, cognitively uh, impaired or disabled such that, you know, when the daughter finds out, she rejects that supposed care. But we can imagine cases where the daughter never is able to, to understand that, you know, maybe she's cognitively has some kind of cognitive disability, um, we could see where this idea of, of, of uh, constructing a counterfactual or hypothetical consent can lead to really coercive and, and immoral actions. So one has to be really careful with constructing counterfactuals. Right, so Kate says, the closer I come to discerning the reason for the resistance and avoiding coercion, the more fully do I fulfill my obligation to care for her. Now, case five is the adult with a generative condition affecting judgment. So this case, she says, strides between cases three and four. So for example, the person starts out needing care because of a degenerative condition. As the condition grows worse, judgment is affected and the individual grows increasingly unable to respond to our care or guide us in caregiving by their responsiveness or lack of responsiveness. So, right, this could be in the case of like Alzheimer's uh, or dementia, where we might want to start out by treating uh, the person as if it's the case of, uh, um, you know, three, but then it ends up being the case of four. So maybe at one point in time, we want to treat them in the way that we would with the case three, and later on, we have to treat them more as in the case four, right? When, when they entirely just don't understand the kind of care they're being given, and you have to, you know, think like, okay, well, I knew the person when um, they were in a better condition and they wanted this kind of care, even though right now it's not clear whether in this moment they want the kind of care they're getting because they're, you know, uh, uh, they have this de de uh, degenerative condition that's affecting their judgment. So case six, the adult in need of care refusing medication. This is a really interesting one, right? We can think of one who needs a kind of medication to survive, and, and, you know, they're not cognitively uh, disabled or anything like that. They don't have anything that's uh, negatively affecting their judgment. They're just simply refusing the medication, right? So what if a person did understand the connection between the seizure medication and the reduction in seizures, but still refused to take the pill? She says, then we would need to know the person and her reason for refusing in order to know how properly to care for her. Perhaps she resents being cared for and feels that having to take pills impedes her freedom and, strange as it might sound, she would prefer to have those seizures than follow a pill regimen. 
right? Or perhaps she simply hates swallowing these large and bitter pills and claims to not care what the consequences are of not taking them. Or she may not want to squander scarce resources, uh, you know, on that medication. Maybe she would prefer to use the money to help her children uh, instead, right? So what would we do in this situation with this person who is uh, not cognitively disabled or, you know, their, their judgment isn't affected, but they're refusing this kind of care? Well, basically, we would want to do as much as we can to try and, uh, in a positive way, convince them to, to take the medication, right? So she says the best carers, if they remain convinced that the person would be better off taking the seizure medication, would attempt to find ways around the obstacles, not by like slipping in the medication when they don't know and, and they end up taking it, but by, you know, consciously convincing the person that it is a good to take that medication. Um, it might be the case though, right? If the person never wants to take the medication, then you would be in the wrong by trying to care for them by forcing them to take the medication or constantly harping on them about taking the medication. Okay, case seven, the depressed person, right? So in this case, Kate says that care looks for the long haul with the depressed person. That if we know the person, we may know that such depression is not uh, you know, a constant state. But even if the person is a stranger, we know that often depression is not unremitting and generally can be mitigated if not cured. We try to do what is consistent with the person's values and concerns when the person is not depressed, right? Most importantly, we try to lift the depression. So she says, you know, th this is one of the most deeply troubling cases a carer can face. What we want, would want to do in this case is think, when the person is not depressed, what are the values they, they, they have? Uh, what are their desires? What would they want when they're not in a depressed state? And we should try to do that for the person. But it might be the case that, you know, uh, if the person, even in the non-depressed state, I don't know, would want to, like, for example, in their life, it might be best to allow them to do that uh, as opposed to continually trying to help them if even in a non-depressed state before they were depressed, um, they would have decided themselves they wouldn't have wanted to continue on, you know, living in that way, right? And we can think of that a bit similar to someone who has maybe like uh, um, a disease that, that really is painful and they don't want to, you know, continue on living with that disease. Um, it might be best by caring for them to stop trying to um, to help them, Um even if you would not want to maybe, right, like commit suicide or something like that. Um, but in the best case, right, it's really difficult. You want to try your best to care for the person, but you want to do it in such a way that, again, you, you look for the long haul and you don't think that you can just care for them and solve this issue uh, right away. And you look, um, you look towards uh, certain things that someone who intimately knows the person would know about them when they weren't in a depressed state of mind to try and help them uh, as a way to, to think of like guiding, right? You would guide uh, the non-depressed person. You would use how they were then in their values to guide your actions towards them when they are depressed now. And then let's look at case eight. The mature, conscious, autonomous subject who refuses to act in accordance with her objective good. So this could be, you know, a mature adult, right? who just doesn't want to wear a helmet when they're riding on a motorcycle, right? Um, would you would, it, would you truly be caring for them by forcing them to wear a helmet when they ride on a motorcycle? Kate says, no. You know, you can try your best to, to really care for them and, and convince them why they need to wear a helmet. And maybe one day, you know, they will recognize, yeah, you were really caring for me. Um, but, right, you can't guarantee that. You can't guarantee that someone will, will take up your, your care as care. Um, and what you need to do is balance respect and care. So by coercing them to wear the helmet, you might be caring for them to some extent, but you are denying them respect. And remember, right, one of the components of, of care is to take into account the values and desires of the other person. So if you don't respect them, you're not fully caring for the other person. So care requires, right, that we respect the person for whom we care. 
The rightness of an action we choose depends on a, 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 um, an accurate discernment, careful attention to the other, mindfulness, the requisite competencies, and sufficient agility in one's responsiveness, right? right? Knowing when and to what extent to help them. You know, maybe this time I shouldn't try to talk to them again about wearing the helmet. You know, like I've I kind of been pressing them to not, you know, upset them. Maybe I should just like not this time, you know, try to convince them to wear the helmet. Right. Um, so this is against a kind of general principle, right, or standard that would apply across all cases um, where, you know, carers could paternally, uh, paternalistically impose you know, certain rules on, on the cared for, like the wearing of the helmet. So we can understand the difference between care and respect as care committing us to respond to the other when appropriate, right? Where you, you have developed that virtuous disposition of care. And then having respect, which commits us to avoid interfering with another, where again, right, uh, we wouldn't uh, coerce someone else to, you know, to do something that we think is in their, their, uh, for their own good, even though they might not recognize it. We want to respect what their own desires are and respond in certain ways such that we can facilitate them. And if those desires, again, right, if those desires aren't things that we think are morally acceptable, that doesn't mean we have to do it, right? Now, this is maybe part of the thing that, uh, could be troubling for some about care ethics, right? It doesn't give you certainty. Despite all our best efforts, we may fail. We have to accept the reality of moral luck. Kate says that understanding care from the perspective of the completion of care presents the hard reality that whether or not our action will hit its mark ultimately depends not on us, but on the cared for and on conditions not in our power to affect. So sometimes, uh, we might really want to care for the person and we know what it is that uh, the kind of care they need uh, t for them to flourish, but maybe we actually don't have the resources. And so in that sense, we fail because we're unable to care for them. Or maybe, right, um, we, we care for the person and we try to do things that we think eventually, you know, like our children, eventually when the child grows older, they'll look back and say, wow, you know, mom, thanks for feeding me all the vegetables, you know, instead of cookies all the time. Well, it might just be the case that maybe one day the child resents the parent for always feeding them vegetables and not feeding them cookies. And actually, in that case, if the, if the child, when they're an adult, still doesn't recognize that as care, then one would have failed in caring for their child, as absurd as that might sound. Right? But we always, again, right, have to respect uh, the subjectivity of the other. So... A clear conscience for care ethics is difficult to ensure. There might always be a kind of nagging guilt. And in this way, Kate says, in this sense, caregiving is morally hazardous because we can try our best, but despite our best efforts, again, right, we might fail. So finally, we can look at then uh, certain moral obligations we might think we have to receive care or to give care. So one is answering to non-needs, right? Um, if someone is trying to care for us, but they're trying to do something they think we need, but we don't really need, do we have an obligation to just let them do what, you know, the kind of care they're trying to give us? The answer is no, right? We can respectfully uh, decline the care being offered by someone else if we don't actually need it. Now, if we actually do need the care and the other person is respectfully offering the care, then we would actually have uh, an obligation to uh, accept that care because we almost have an obligation to, to, to facilitate them being morally good people as well. And in both ways, right? By me accepting the care, uh, then, you know, we're both being morally good people. Now, what about care that's offered in good faith, but without the requisite competence? So I might need um, to be taken care of uh, and watched over closely if I'm sick. And I have a friend who wants to help me, right? And they want to watch over me, but they actually don't know enough about what is required to like uh, uh, help me get over the sickness. Would I have an obligation to accept their care? 
The answer is no. Even though the care is offered in good faith, they really want to do everything they can to help me. If they don't actually have the knowledge, right, the know-how to care for me, I'm not under an obligation to uh, receive their care or accept it. Now, of course, in the case of the insincere care, where the person maybe wants to offer care because they think, oh, uh, this will give me social prestige, right? People will think, oh, what a nice person this is. Uh, and they might be offering, you know, to care, like to give me things that I need to, fa uh, to facilitate my own flourishing. If it's insincere, if they're not doing it because they're actually virtuous, because they care about, you know, helping me for the sake of helping me, then we don't have an obligation to accept that kind of care. Now, I want to look at these last two cases, the refusers and the over-demanders. So, Kate says that because care is more complex than the coordinated action of two actors, the care refuser, when the care refuser refuses care that can benefit him, harms not only himself, right? So if I need care and someone offers it and I refuse it, I of course harm myself because I don't get the care I need, but I also do uh, harm to the other person who's offering the care to the caregiver because I do injury to the relationship between us. Right? When we refuse care offered in good faith and with the requisite competence, we refuse relationship. So we deny, you know, kind of uh, uh, part of the social fabric that makes possible uh, our flourishing in the first place, right? We have to enable, we have to allow the practices of care to continue. If, again, right, uh, they're done in good faith and they're actually done to meet the, the, the needs of another. Finally, what about the over-demanders? So someone who is demanding way too much care. Well, obviously the person who's demanding way too much care is wrong in demanding this care. And another is not under an obligation to meet all those demands of the cared for. So again, right, it's not about simple self-sacrifice in care ethics, right? It's about through experience learning, right, how to act in certain ways, to whom, to what degree I should act, how I should act. She says, caring for those who are meaningful in our lives is one of the most important ethical projects we undertake, and its failure is a great wound, a genuine harm. If the carer's success in caring hinges on the uptake of the cared for, those cared for have an obligation to receive care to the extent to which they are uh, in a condition to do so, when it is offered in good faith and with the requisite competence. I think an interesting discussion question here is that, you know, in one way, care ethics is more realistic because of its partiality and its contextuality. But on the other hand, because of this, I think we can ask, does it actually then work in practice? Is the lack of impartiality, general, generality, and the fact that it's not a rule-based ethics overall make this ethics actually maybe less realistic and that it's not generally successful in its application? So what do you think compared with uh, other maybe rule-based ethics like deontology and uh, utilitarianism or other forms of consequentialism uh, that are more impartial and can actually abstract in a more general, we might think they're therefore less realistic because they're not based on context, but is it actually the opposite? So does care ethics succeed in being more realistic or because of its partiality and contextuality and its lack of uh, generalized ability and impartiality, is it actually less realistic in its application?